Now, before we talk about this week's Raw, a couple of things. Number one, make sure you click that red button that says subscribe. Hashtag subscriber die. And then click the bell. What the hell? So that way, when YouTube's notifications work, you actually know when OTRS Central has uploaded a new video. Follow the show on Twitter and Facebook. And most importantly of all, OTRS Central now has a store at Pro Wrestling Tees. Check it out. And hashtag buy a shirt, please. Anyways... I was excited about this week's Raw. And, of course, the WWE rewards me for that bit of anticipation that they had built in me, that bit of excitement that I had, by giving me a first two-hour run of Raw that was just complete shit. The first two hours of the show was god-awful bad. The first two hours of the show was so incredibly, massively boring. I don't know why they wanted to backload this show so much, because it got better in hour three. But the first two hours are terrible. And in particular, when you're thinking about getting a show off to a hot and exciting, exciting start, the last thing you think about is wash your ass Dean Ambrose. As soon as Dean Ambrose comes out, it's like the life gets sucked out of the segment. The life gets sucked out of a show. And all the crap about him and Rollins, it was even funny to be... Seth Rollins is acting in a way and conducting himself in the way that Dean Ambrose should be conducting himself. It was just really weird. And then we got into the whole stuff about, don't call me brother. It's not a racial thing, guys. Let's calm down. And what I don't understand is I don't care about either of these guys. So how is teaming them up together going to make me care about either of them or both together? I care more about Bo Dallas's new look of, I'm the mechanic at the local used car dealership, and then afterwards on the weekend, I'm going to go play cornhole and drink some Jaeger at the Forest Preserve look. That's what I was more interested in. It took us over 10 minutes to get to something interesting, which was The Miz, and I was more focused on Bo Dallas, and ultimately it's because Ambrose and Rollins sucked the life out of this opening segment. So, of course, it gets better by having Bailey face Alexa Bliss, and nothing says a match matters. Like, almost as soon as it starts, we cut to Nia Jax, coming out, and then we go to a commercial. Why can't we do the side-by-side stuff where we show the commercial and the show like they do on SmackDown? I think it's crazy because you're just basically saying this match doesn't fucking matter if you interrupt it with a commercial. And why did they insist on having Saucer Banks being able to punk out Nia Jax like this again? I mean, again. It's bad enough if she's choking her out and tapping her out. Now this little scrawny, bald-headed bitch is coming up from behind and wiping out Nia Jax. That makes no fucking sense. Does anybody fucking believe that whatsoever? And then the ridiculousness of the WWE and this formula they've had over the years of having a challenger beat the champion in a non-title match. To me, there's only a few reasons a champion should lose. Because otherwise, if you just have them lose all fucking willy-nilly, it, it devalues them as a champion and their championship reign. There's only a few reasons why you would maybe want to have them lose. It might be in a tag match where they're not even factored into the decision. You might say it's by their choice via countout or disqualification. That's fine. One of those really, truly special occasions where you maybe do have them win a match on Raw or SmackDown, but then come the pay-per-view, they don't win the title, so the champion ultimately goes over, or if you do a title change. But they do this all the time, and it's so stupid. Like, you're in this story with Sasha, just so that way now you're going to throw fucking Bailey into the damn mix. You got a freaking little boy crying because he saw Bailey, and yet Alexa, I believe, got the bigger reaction when she came out. That says all you need to fucking know. And it's because, again, instead of the WWE actually trying to focus on writing and developing and cultivating a good story, we just want to shoehorn three or four people, it appears like, into every fucking match at SummerSlam because we just want to be lazy about this shit. I will say the segment later on with Kurt Angle fit because that would be just like a woman when Kurt Angle has this big decision or this big big matzo ball hanging over his head. Leave it to women to bring their bullshit to a guy and want to force that on the guy like it's the most important thing in the world when the guy doesn't fucking care. Um, and then the way Bailey approached it, you could almost hear the heel there a little bit, talking about, well, yeah, but I actually pinned her. I'm like, maybe there you go. But I don't give a shit. We got several minutes of an SB's video package where you could clearly see Steph and the company using philanthropy as a part of their business model for the 21st century, like a lot of corporations do. 
Uh, you saw Jarius Robertson, and to me, I think it's a slam dunk next year in New Orleans that he's going to be the Warrior Award winner, so it is what it is. One thing I will touch on that was good throughout the course of the night was they had a Roman Reigns video package right after this, then an interview with him, then we had a Samoa Joe video package and an interview with him. That was your main event. This was a big deal. These were guys facing off for the chance to face Brock Lesnar for the Universal title at SummerSlam. They did do a good job of building this matchup throughout the night like it was a big fucking deal, and I did appreciate that. Also calling out that they managed to announce a couple of other matches, uh, Sasha and Bayley, and then what is it, Finn and Samson. We're actually getting multiple matches already booked for next week, already being announced. What a novel concept. So even in the crap that was a suck fest of the first two hours of the show, there were still some good things going on. Uh, the Gruiserweight tag was not one of them. I remember back in the day when you used to use a shotgun Saturday night, a heat, a Sunday night heat, a velocity, something like that, to build up to a Raw, to build up to a SmackDown, uh, and that's the way it should have been. Now we take Raw and we use it to build to shit that has far lesser viewership, like the Total Divas crap, or in this case, 205 Live on the WWE Network. We should be using 205 Live to tie into Raw or SmackDown. Or in this case, specifically Raw. We should not be using Raw to devote several segments to pushing a network show that the vast majority of a Raw audience isn't fucking watching. And who gave a shit about this fucking Cruiserweight tag match? I'm just saying. Uh, Enzo, Cass, Big Show, this whole segment that went down. I'm not saying it was done poorly, but when I see Enzo, all this talk about Certified G and everything else... You know, it's kind of like QPP the pineapple with the random voice inflections. Like, ah, 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 ah. I mean, it is what it is. That, that act's going to get old kind of quickly. Then when Cass comes out, cue the generic heel theme music. My God, that is terrible. The only thing I hope they get out of this that they learn from Great Balls of Fire is every time he comes out, he should stand at a point where he blocks the C out of the big Cass so that way it says big ass right above his head. That's all I'm saying. And then you cue the big slow and you get several minutes of a plotting fight. Kaz looks good here. You know, it's a shame that I look at Big Show like this because he is a legend and he's meant a lot to that company for so many years. But uh, it's well past time. And if we're building to this being a big SummerSlam match, I will take a pass. Uh, one glorious thing that did happen in the first two hours, though, was Elias Sampson. Now, of course, he was interrupted again because, by God, why would we let, want to let this whole thing play out and have him get actual real heat on himself? But he did what he needed to do. Fuck Finny the Twink. Finn Balor fucking sucks. Thank you, Elias Sampson. You're in Nashville, so what better way to end this shit than to bust open Finn the hard way with that guitar? See, Elias Sampson, he broke one guitar. He's about to draw some dimes. A certain Memphis mid-card piece of crap broke 10,000 in his career, drew zero fucking dimes. And then after this, instead of worrying about the dude that hit you with the freaking guitar, here's a random thing of freaking Bray Wyatt, and who gives a fuck? And I most certainly don't give a fuck about these two having a program together, but why wouldn't Finn be concerned about potentially wanting to chase off after Elias Sampson? Who gives a shit about this dude on the freaking Titantron? I'm just saying. But Elias Sampson, my hero of the week. He struck one for the men that still happen to watch professional wrestling. Funk, fuck that underwear model Finny the Twink. Fuck that shit. He sucks, and soon enough, those of you that don't realize it are going to recognize it too. Uh, Tozawa during, versus Davari, I didn't watch. I don't care. Next. So you got two hours, and outside of Elias Sampson and him being the real hero of the week, it was a lot of crap. So you thought the last hour was going to give you all types of action. Oh, baby, did it ever. Kurt Angle's big announcement. Now, I know I was on record talking about hashtag we want Dixie. And, and yeah, I did. I'm not ashamed of that. And I know that a lot of people are going to have a lot of thoughts about this. And a lot of people that I saw thought it was a big letdown. My God, this was fucking magnificent. Because even the people who were talking about an illegitimate son, everybody was pointing to Chad Gable, Chad Gable. It's like the Schleg Daddy booked this shit. Like, if we're going to have Kurt Angle have a bastard son, we're going to make it count, bitches. We're going to make a little Barack Obama out of this and try and make a fucking star. This was incredible. I popped big time when they had him announce 
that his son was fucking Jason Jordan then. As Raw continued, keeping track of Jason Jordan's Wikipedia page and American Alpha's Wikipedia page and seeing how everybody was updating it and what all the shit they were putting on there was fucking epic in and of itself. And leave it to the WWE to try and make Kurt Angle having a son by a black woman back almost 30 years ago when he would have been in college when he wasn't married or anything into some type of controversial big fucking life altering type of shit. That's that's the WWE of today. The dude had made a fucking baby almost 30 years ago, according to the story. And we're going to make it out to be some controversial fucking thing. <laughs> oh, good old WWE. I guess, I guess it's one of those things that Kurt Angle is packing that chocolate milk. So that brings me to this point. If he was packing the chocolate milk, then the mama still could be white. And that means we could still get Dixie after all. I know you're saying, fuck you. No, it's fuck you. Don't kill the dream. But fuck, if everybody talking about Chad Gable, Chad Gable, you look at Jason Jordan, and at least from a look standpoint, he has more of it than Chad Gable. And I'm sorry, we have enough of these Chad Gable fucks. We need a few more Jason Jordan fucks. So why not take the black man, in this case, and put him in a situation where he gets the rub, maybe a bad choice of words, but he gets a line with a Hall of Famer, the authority figure on your flagship show. Why not run with it and see what the fuck happens? Doesn't mean what else are you going to do? You're going to have Stephanie McMahon come back and have the shit lead to Triple H? Fuck that shit. This was epic. This was fucking awesome. Kurt Angle was spraying that chocolate milk in somebody. And it's incredible. Or him and Raka Khan, maybe, baby. I don't know what the fuck happened. But man, this is one of these examples of a surprise could be a surprise that doesn't make it a good surprise. This was a surprise that was a fucking epic surprise, and I loved every damn minute of it. While it was not the direction I thought they were going to go or, frankly, wanted them to go, they've given it to me. And oh, man, I can relate to this. Kurt Angle is now a hero to me, and I want more, 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 more. <laughs> so at this point, I didn't know if anything else was going to be able to follow up. But we got the Hardy Boys versus the Revival in really what was just an old school tag team match. Appreciated this quite a bit. We actually tried to get some heat on somebody on Matt to build to a hot tag. Novel concept. The match gets over. The match works. Revival wins. My thing is, is that if this is not leading ultimately to going broken Hardys, then we're kind of getting to the point where we're devaluing these guys who just got the biggest reaction out of anybody a few months ago at WrestleMania and created one of those great WrestleMania moments. It's not full-on burial yet, but we're starting to bury them a little bit further down the prioritization list and starting to, you know, decrease the return that you get for the hardy investment. And leave it to the WWE, just like what they did with the Dudleys. You bring them back and you really didn't do shit with them. You've now brought the Hardys back and outside of the big mania moment you really haven't done shit with them either I hope this is leading to them finally getting the shit solved with Global Force Wrestling and Anthem and getting the broken Hardy rights because otherwise I don't know why the hell they've jobbed out the Hardys on back to back weeks on television that's fucking crazy it just is I appreciate the Revival's mantra in their style no flips just fists I'm cool with that but if anything, why have a decisive finish here? Why not have it be some type of DQ finish where the Revival gets disqualified because they're breaking the rules because they just want to beat the shit out of the Hardys? I would be better with that than has it just be a straight up they beat them situation because at this point in time, why would the Hardys get, need another match with them? Because we've already seen them beat them once. But the match was really, really good. And I thought after Kurt Angle's, you know... Uh, Fever announcement, if you will. Now, apparently, Kurt Angle gets invited to the cookout, huh? Uh, imagine that. He'll bring the painkillers. Anyways, um, <laughs> the Hardy Boys revival. This is a really good match. But it was all coming down to the main event. Samoa Joe versus Roman Reigns. There was going to be a Samoan named Joe that was going to win this match. You thought. And you probably didn't. And the thing is, is that as I'm watching the match, y you knew... 
that Braun was coming back. Like, I don't think that was a surprise to anybody. And that's the challenge with this is, is it good even though it's predictable if it's done well? Or is it, if you can see it coming from a mile away, is the WWE not doing a good enough job? And does that make the segment not very good? I don't know. But the, the match was kind of okay, but you could just kind of tell these guys weren't doing a whole hell of a lot or needing to do too much because, frankly, they didn't need to. They've wrestled each other before, but you also knew this was not going to lead to a decisive finish. So when Braun comes back, of course, he gets the babyface pop that he's going to since he's been feuding with Roman Reigns, and they bring back Braun as a monster and very strong here, and now we know where this is going to go ultimately. You know, Unless there's a, a big, massive change of plans, it's a four-way at SummerSlam with Lesnar defending against Joe, Roman, and Strowman. And that's fine. To me, that's the one match at SummerSlam that actually should have more than two participants, but we're probably going to get several more of them. You might as well at this point. You might as well throw all these guys together and see what the hell is going to happen. Uh, the one thing I appreciate right now about Joe and Roman and Strowman is that the shit they do has got this physical type of big fight feel and style to it. It's just badass. And I'm enjoying watching these guys and doing what they're doing. It doesn't take away from the fact that, for the most part, the first two hours of Raw was the absolute drizzling shits. It doesn't take away from the fact that I didn't get Dixie Carter on there for my own train wreck awesome reasons. It doesn't change the fact still that even though Hardy Boys and Revival was a good match, I don't see what the hell they're trying to accomplish with the Hardys or what they're doing. Um, and if they don't hurry up and get the broken gimmick available for these guys, I don't see why you even have them at this point. And I most certainly, again, don't see where they're going with this that makes any real sense or is going to be productive. Um, not a great Raw. And in general, even with the, the Kurt Angle announcement that to me was epic and great, you could, I think you could tell my energy level is just not that high. Maybe it's because I'm a little bit tired, perhaps. But I think it's more so the fact that you waited until hour three to give us anything that was really truly worth a shit. Anything that we really actually cared about. You know, if anything, do Angle's big announcement at the beginning of the night. Or do it somewhere else. Don't wait until the hour two main event and then you try to cram everything else in. I mean, again, you look at this, the way the show was structured this week. You really thought it was a good idea to have Ambrose and Rollins dominate a freaking opening segment. It was trash. It's fucking trash because these guys have become fucking trash. Ambrose because he's fucking lazy and Seth Rollins because he's a crappy baby face. Thank you, WWE. I mean, the shit they did with the women's match. You know, you've got cruiserweight matches. And frankly, again, who gives a shit? We're devoting several minutes of prime time to promote appearances at the ESPYs. Uh, we've got Enzo kind of shoehorned into a story between Cass and now Big Show. And it's just kind of weird. Because Enzo's cutting promos, but where's ultimately going to be the payoff to him cutting these promos? Uh, other than Elias hitting Finn, Finny the Twink, with the freaking guitar shot from hell, there wasn't a lot of excitement on this week's show. It doesn't have to be three hours of great, but stop backfilling your show so much. you got to give us something, because by the time you get through those first two hours, it's torture. And I'm sure plenty of people shut off Raw before they actually got to the good stuff this week. And that, of course, is WWE's fault. So be better next time, damn it.